want to welcome everyone to our next installment of the Partner Positives webinar series, which is Neon One's ecosystem overview of our amazing partners and the things that they're doing to help organizations grow, scale, and just generally connect with people in, in ways that are going to uh, just kind of help people and help grow uh, your nonprofit's mission. So on the next slide, what we're going to do is just kind of talk a little bit about Neon One. One more click will show us that beautiful spaceship uh, that we love to showcase. And, and so Neon One, if you're not familiar, is a technology ecosystem powering nonprofits with services and, and software. Uh, we're, we're exclusively focused on the nonprofit industry. And so if you're unfamiliar with us, on the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that we actually do. The, the broader Neon One ecosystem uh, does a lot of key things for uh, over 30,000 nonprofits that we serve. Um, Neon CRM is actually the one that we're going to hear a tiny bit today in regards to its relationship to volunteer local. Some really cool things that we've been able to do with the team over there. But uh, we also do uh, giving days, client case management, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, arts and ticketing, web, uh, web design. Um, and then we, we are a little bit different, I would say, in that we curate the broader ecosystem of software and services uh, by, by basically looking for best of breed connection. So when we talk about integration, when we talk about partnership, we don't do things just for marketing. We do things to actually drive uh, data, actually drive uh, success. And so what's really exciting is that, for instance, Volunteer Local went through a very detailed certification program. <laughs> Kaylee and her team can, can definitely attest to that. And uh, it means that we've curated it to sync into Neon CRM. So actually, a little bit later on on the next slide, um, to kind of showcase that after, after Kaylee's amazing content. Um, uh, well, actually, first, I want to go over some, some housekeeping items. One more click will show us what we're going to be doing, which is that, yes, this is being recorded right now. Even my adjustment of my unicorn uh, uh, hat is being done uh, in the recording. Uh, and this is going to be put on our partner channel, YouTube, so you'll be uh, able to access that at any time. And of course, the uh, the teams, if you need more information, will definitely be following up with uh, materials and, and any further interest you may have in learning about uh, our, our software services, respectively, as, as well as just the content itself that Kaylee's going to be sharing because they're experts in volunteerism. One more slide will showcase the fact that, yes, indeed, we do want to actually have some practical lessons shown here. So we're going to be learning about managing a multi-generational campaign uh, for volunteer management. So great. Like somebody signs up for your programs and you want a detailed profile of that person to round out alongside giving and other types of things. How do you do that? We're actually going to showcase how those two things can connect. A lot of people really struggle with getting good volunteer information into their database of record for things like fundraising, email communications. A lot of times those systems are separate. I experienced this a lot at my last job, for instance, where it was like nearly impossible to get this in one place. We've solved that for you. So that's something that we'll be able to showcase. If you're interested in learning about this, I'm just going to quickly flash our contact information right now before handing the mic over to uh, Kaylee and her amazing uh, overview. So one more slide showcases that uh, contact information because we love to make good happen. And if you're interested in learning more about our software and services, here's some contact information. Also follow us on, on Twitter, Facebook, Neon One Tech. Uh, would love to, to have the conversation and uh, tweet at us and, and maybe tell, tell uh, us what your favorite volunteer projects are if you're on social media. I'll be tweeting a little bit myself during today's presentation. But Kaylee, with that said, I'm gonna hand things on over to you. Um, and and you know, if you have any uh, need of me, let me know, but otherwise the show is yours. And tell me when to launch that poll, by the way, because we do have a question for the folks in the room uh, to help us kind of understand how you were managing things. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for the warm introduction. And hi, everybody. I'm Kaylee, the president of Volunteer Local. And today it is an honor and a pleasure to get to share with you all that I've learned about building a successful volunteer program for multiple generations. So um, 
some of you may know, I gave this talk at the International Festival and Events Association uh, Conference in Virginia uh, just a few months ago, and I got a lot of great feedback and a lot of um, customers who couldn't be there asked if there was an opportunity to see this presentation later on. So again, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to get to share it with you today. And um, you know, just a heads up that I, I'm really not a volunteer coordinator. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a data nerd over here running Volunteer Local. And we've everything that we've learned about these volunteer initiatives, we've learned from you. So if you have feedback for us or you want to add some insight, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call after the webinar today. I'll have my contact information at the very end of the deck. Okay, so today's presentation, um, I'm gonna start tell you a little bit about myself, uh, and then we'll do a quick poll to learn a little bit about you and who we have in the room today. And then we're gonna talk about some perceptions or gentle stereotypes, as I like to call them, about the different generations that are you know, kind of living together today. Uh, there are six of them. Um, and then we'll dive in on each generation. So we're actually gonna talk about the silence, baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z, and how what we know about their generations translates into how they volunteer, how they respond to incentives, the types of roles they gravitate towards, and some of the best ways to um, tell them thank you and show appreciation for them. And then of course, we'll talk about the future and what this all means, we'll wrap everything up. And then we'll uh, chat about a bit about the integration with Neon CRM. I'll actually show you a little demonstration inside a real volunteer local account. Did I miss anything, Tim? Are we good? I think the only other thing that I want to make sure that people know is uh, we're going to have some time for questions. Feel free to use the Q&A box um, and, uh, and definitely um, you know, ask questions. We, we're here to help you. So I'm really excited about today's presentation. Perfect. Thank you for adding that. And I've got a little timer over here on my phone to make sure that I do leave enough time for questions. I love to talk, so I will be sure to leave time at the end for other people to chime in. All right, so a little bit about myself and about my company. So my name is Kaylee again. I run Volunteer Local. We are a software company. We work with organizations, nonprofits, events all over the world to help them recruit their volunteers online. So we love festivals, of course. This is an annual trip that we take as a team every year to Bonnaroo um, in the middle of Tennessee. It's a ton of fun. We all wear our t-shirts, we hang a little flag. Um, but we're also big advocates for volunteering in any setting. Uh, we actually have an employee uh, requirement in our handbook that everybody needs to volunteer at least 10 hours a year to a nonprofit of their choosing, regardless of whether or not they're using Volunteer Local to recruit volunteers. So it's really um, important to us and a core value to our company to get out there and be involved in our communities. Today we're gonna to talk about um, the generations. And I, I wanna be sure when we're starting this conversation to make to just say that people really aren't defined by their generation. Um, you know, there's no boxes here. We're making some pretty big generalizations about folks based on when they were born and the environments in which they grew up um, economically, socially. Um, but you know, I just I think that there are things we can learn and there's some predictability that we can talk about, but I don't want anyone to feel like they're in a box today. So um, there are no, no true stereotypes here. So the core question that I set out to answer when we started doing this research was, do generations volunteer differently? And what we learned is that they really do. Um, people are experiencing different stages of life. They're uniquely incentivized and motivated. And again, it, it all comes back to the environment in which they grew up, how they were raised, um, the economy at the time, what they believe about volunteering and how to be involved. Um, civic engagement is something that I think translates differently when you're talking to someone who's a baby boomer versus a millennial or even a Gen Zer. So let's start with the greatest generation, the youngest of which would be 94 today. So I doubt there's anyone from the greatest generation on the, on the webinar call, but um, that being said, I think it's important to mention them because uh, this is really a remarkable generation. They're known as the doers. Um, you know, they saved the world, World War II, and then they built the nation. They're assertive, they're energetic, excellent team players. Um, what I thought was interesting about the greatest generation is that they have very um, near absolute standards of right and wrong. So no surprise that Captain America came out of or was born out of this idea of the greatest generation being you know, we're morally we're right and we're gonna go out there and we're gonna fight for what we believe is right. And then civic duty. So um, the greatest generation are definitely known for their loyalty to country, to um, their communities. They vote, they unionize, and of course they volunteer. So 
So kind of a quick, if you want to wrap it up with a bow here, this generation is the use it up, fix it up, make it do or do without generation. And I put a, uh, a picture of a bread bag here because I actually have a little uh, rug that was passed down from my great grandmother during the depression. Um, and it was made of bread bags, made of plastic that are woven together. So I still have it. This thing is indestructible. Um, and it's a great, I think, uh, symbol of this generation and, and the resourcefulness that they had to come up with in order to get through some of the difficulties that happened during their lifetimes. Okay, let's dive in then to the silent generation. Um, these folks were born between 1927 and 1945. So you may very well have some of these volunteers uh, involved in your nonprofit. Um, what's really interesting about the silent generation is that they are truly the richest retirees in the country. Um, and they really wanna live their final days in peace. So they're not out there adventure seeking. They're looking for things to give back and contribute and they're looking for peace. Um, they, they also share this strong belief of right versus wrong. They believe marriage is for life. Um, they possess a strong sense of transgenerational common values. What does that mean? That means that um, they believe that their core values are shared by every generation after them. It's not even a question in their mind. Like, of course, we all agree that these things are resolute and they're right. Um, and I, I thought that was very interesting. And, and then uh, this is kind of a cool generation because they grew up during the era of the big bands and they really kicked off the civil rights movement. The silence are known for playing by the rules. Um, they were rewarded for playing by the rules all throughout their lives. And that means that men and women adhered to kind of this idea of what they should be in the roles that they should play in the home and in the workplace. So the silence as volunteers are kind of a unique group. Um, this is actually a picture of my grandma. She gave me permission to put it on here today. She's part of the silent generation. So the silence, they have an appreciation for simple things in life. They do have a lot of free time. They're looking for peace and fulfillment in retirement. These individuals are motivated to volunteer in their communities. They're avid readers. Um, they actually are, you know, they're the ones reading the newspapers. So it doesn't hurt if you're trying to get out to the silence to put an ad in your local paper. Um, and I would always encourage you to include a phone number in addition to a website link. Um, we all know that they have no problem picking up the phone and calling when they want to get involved in a nonprofit. They're disciplined, they're self-sacrificing, they're cautious. And that means that you should probably consider having some clear structure and guidelines around the volunteer positions they've selected. So one, um, one thing I would encourage you to do is make sure that you have a check-in location, a very clear description of what the role will entail. Um, you know, you don't wanna be leaving anyone feeling like they're not quite sure what they're signing up for. And then of course they're resourceful and they will avoid waste. And so it's just important to know that cheap swag will not impress them, whereas a handwritten thank you note really will go a long way with this generation. Baby boomers. Um, so for those of you in the room who identify as baby boomers, this is a massive generation. Um, and they're kind of divided into two sects. So we'll talk about that in just a moment, subsects. But we've got uh, the flower power, like the, the boomers were really known for being optimistic and driven and they have this free love movement. Um, they're tech curious and they see technology as an innovation requiring a learning process. Now this is in direct contrast to millennials who see technology as something that should learn them. So boomers are not afraid to roll up their sleeves and treat technology like something they can figure out how to do. Whereas millennials have a little bit of a sense of entitlement, like this technology, if it's not user friendly, I'm not gonna do it. So I thought that was a really interesting um, division in how we look at tech. And the baby boomers are kind of phasing into their golden years, but what's really cool about the boomers is that they're not looking for a quiet retirement. They wanna go out there, they wanna do things that they didn't have the time to do before. They're kind of adventure seekers um, and they're definitely looking up uh, hobbies that can take up their time. They're actually the first generation to even coin the term retirement, which I thought was kind of interesting. So again, I, I mentioned before that this generation is divided. Um, it is so massive that you kind of have to look at it as these two subsects. We've got the save the world revolutionaries of the 60s and the 70s, and this is that flower power movement that we talked about before. And then you've got the party hardy career climbers, and really that was the term yuppies is when that was coined um, in the 70s and the 80s. So they, they could not be more different in terms of that character and that personality type. Um, and they all, they all fit into this category of boomers. So again, going back to what I said before, you can't really put people into a box because of when they were born, but we can learn things about them, generally speaking. Um, and here we've got the boomers who are so different 
depending on uh, you know, the decade in which they were born. So let's talk about baby boomers as volunteers. How can we take what we know about them and apply it to our volunteer programs? Well, we mentioned before, they want to have an active retirement. So they're most likely to volunteer to just have a good time. They wanna go contribute, they wanna be helpful, but they're also just trying to have fun. They're adventure seekers. Um, baby boomers are really known for this buy it now and use credit. Half of them have no retirement savings at all. So boomers will respond well to instant gratification. If you give them a free drink, a festival pass, or even a VIP perk, they're gonna respond pretty well to that. Baby boomers have a strong desire to challenge the status quo. So I don't know if any of you, again, in the room are boomers, but you might be shaking your head to this one. Um, boomers are really known for taking structures and systems and asking why and improving them and making them better. I think it's a great quality of this generation. And so um, when you're working with boomers, it doesn't hurt to give them feedback loops. You know, if it's a post uh, event survey or an annual survey that you give to your volunteers, um, or if it's just in an anonymous, you know, box at the front desk where they can write down their feedback for the volunteer program and the volunteer coordinator, we know that they love to give feedback and they can help you dramatically improve the volunteer program overall. Uh, boomers are loyal. So, you know, treating them well, making sure that they're acknowledged will go a long way. Um, they'll stay with you and they'll keep working for you and they'll work hard. Uh, and then I put in here, this one isn't necessarily related to the loyalty, but I do think it's an important point. Email communication is definitely preferred. Um, we'll talk about Gen Z in just a moment and how they feel about texting, but uh, boomers really don't respond well to text messages that are not urgent. So they kind of see texting as a little bit of a, you know, it's a little violating for them if you text them like a reminder of their shift. Um, now we're kind of, we're getting more comfortable with this, I think overall as a generation um, with our dental appointments and our hair appointments and they're texting us reminders. So we're getting a little more comfortable with it, but by and large, boomers prefer an email unless it's an urgent, you know, we need, we need you to know this right away kind of update and then you can go ahead and text them. Gen X. So these folks were born between 1965 and 1979. Um, Tim, are you a Gen Xer? No, I'm. I'm technically a millennial. You are. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I wondered. Was, I was born in 1982. Ooh, so, you're right on the edge. So yeah, okay. I, I. I actually feel like I act more like a boomer sometimes, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I. I guess I have to identify as a millennial myself. Sure. When, when well, did we want to launch the poll, by the way? Or we did we want to get through everything and describe it and then ask people what they are? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I actually realized I forgot. We were going to poll everyone before I dove in on this and I actually forgot to do it. So we could do it now. Do you think that would be appropriate? Yeah, I'd love. So we actually put together a poll. And, I, and, and so the poll so, I'm going to launch real quick is I know it's scary given the Halloween theme very vaguely today but what generation do you folks identify with as especially as we've been going through so we have a boomer two boomers i guess i should uh, well I, if i was going to vote i'm not allowed to vote um but i would put millennial kaylee what do you put yourself as i am a millennial um but i'm right on the cusp i'm um almost a gen z so i'm like two years well guess what everybody's answered boomer Okay, cool. Which is cool. Like that's that's actually uh, a little unexpected for me in a, in a way, which is really awesome. So very cool, very cool. All right, well, back, back to you in terms of unpacking our generations. Okay, cool. And I did see a raised hand notification and now I'm new to this webinar software, so I'm not sure what that means. I think it's like either getting attention or something like that, but you definitely use the Q&A folks if you, if you have a question to ask us and I'll be, I'll be reviewing that the whole time. So. Cool. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Awesome. And thank you guys. Um, I should have done this poll right at the beginning, um, but now I'm kind of glad that I waited because we kind of, we got through Boomer and I didn't like pander to you. So I'm feeling good about that. <laughs> I'm going to close the poll window here. Um, so let's talk about Gen X. Uh, these individuals are, I think uh, this might be my favorite generation. They're very entrepreneurial. Um, they're called latchkey kids because a lot of them grew up with a house key around their neck. Both their parents worked, so they would come home to an empty house and let themselves in with the key. Um, they're very critical or kind of suspicious of government and big business. They're entrepreneurial. They're reliant on themselves. They're individualistic. Um, they're also very family focused, so they're really eager to make marriage work and they want to be there for their kids. Um, and then again, you know, they're self-reliant. So they, 
they often commit to themselves before they commit to an organization or to a specific career their whole lives, which I think is kind of interesting too. There we go. Um, so here we are, they're cautious, they're skeptical, they're unimpressed with authority, they're self-reliant. So this generation, you know, how do they volunteer? How can we take what we know about them and apply it to our volunteer programs? A few key things. So Gen Xers really wanna save the neighborhood, not the world. They, again, they're kind of suspicious of anything that's too big. They wanna have an impact. Um, they care a lot about having an impact, but in a meaningful way, in a way that will impact their communities directly. So they're absolutely a great candidates to become volunteers for your nonprofit if you can appeal to that sense of us, not me. I can help the community. It's the collective impact of all of us. Um, they're eager to make marriage work. They want to be there for their kids. So consider, you know, kid-friendly volunteer opportunities for Gen Xers. Um, any opportunity that they can have to make it into a family affair or an opportunity to hang out with their spouse, their significant other, I think is going to go um, pretty far with this group. And then we know that they tend to commit to themselves rather than an organization or a group. So, um, you know, and we talked to some Gen Xers about this too, but they really do gravitate towards kind of autonomous volunteer roles. So they're not really wanting a lot of handholding when they show up, tell them what to do, make it clear what the expectations are, and then let them fly because they will do good work for you and they don't need a lot of oversight. Um, one Gen Xer told me, he was like, you don't want to put a millennial in the middle of a field to manage parking, you know, for your big annual fundraiser that you want a Gen Xer out there doing that because it's a very autonomous role, very little handholding, but it needs to be done right. So I thought that was an interesting example and a good, a good way to showcase this individualistic committing to myself. You know, I, I care about the collective impact, but I can do this job on my own. Okay, let's talk millennials. So I am officially a millennial. Uh, we are, oh yeah, go ahead, Tim. And real quick, uh, Emily, actually one of our participants in today's um, webinar said, hey, I didn't vote in time, but I'm a millennial. So we, we okay. actually have a little, we have a spread. We have a bit of a spread, which is great. That's one, it. One more millennial. Ask us anything, by the way. Um, so, all right, Emily, it's you and me. Um, millennials, we're broke. Uh, we have the most student loan debt of any generation. Um, but we're also the most educated, um, and we're, of course, very, very tech-savvy, soon to be eclipsed by Gen Z, but right now we're the most tech-savvy. Um, we're an interesting generation in that we have really high expectations for ourselves um, personally and professionally, and so millennials actually have a pretty high occurrence of um, mental health issues because there's so much pressure that we put on each other, on ourselves, um, and I think social media fuels a lot of that, although it's not technically in the research, just my opinion. Um, and then participation awards, you know, as much as I don't want to admit it, and I'm sure Emily, you've heard this before too, but it's true, you know, we've been told over and over again that our generation is special and, and we do have this expectation that the world will treat us as special. So um, I thought that was very interesting to see the data reflect that. So millennials, um, bright eyed, they're innovative, they believe they can change the world and I think they can. As volunteers, um, there are some things that you can do to really attract and cater to millennials. What I thought was interesting is that millennials really enjoy working in teams, and so they're the most likely of all your volunteer groups to bring a friend or to come volunteer as a part of their corporate group. A lot of employers are catering to millennials with a little thing called VTO, or volunteer time off, and that's you know days or half days where they get to leave the office, go volunteer together, so as a nonprofit organization, you can really take advantage of this and work with these corporations to get groups of millennials to come in um, as groups and maybe even let them wear their own t-shirts and, and participate for four hours together. Millennials schedule everything. Everything is on their phones, it's on their calendars, and they really prefer specific shift times. So you might have some boomers that drop in, you know, they're coming every Tuesday and maybe they'll show up around noon. They usually work for three or four hours. Millennials need to know, like, you need me at noon, and I can go home at 3 o'clock. So they got to have those start and end times. They respond to digital literacy. They see the world as a 24-7 place. Uh, millennials are known for being impatient, and I don't know if this is necessarily a good thing. Um, but as it relates to our volunteer programs, if you're recruiting them online, you want to pick a product that's simple, fast, user-friendly, instant gratification. You know, you picked your shift, you're good to go. I'm not here to sell Volunteer Local, and I know a lot of people in the room probably already use Volunteer Local, 
but um, this is an important part of any platform. You pick any technology you use for your nonprofit organization. Of course, millennials expect to be applauded for their time that they spend volunteering with you, so make sure you're tracking their hours. And um, we would recommend sending out some certificates at the end of the year, showcasing how many hours they worked collectively. And remember that, you know, collectively this generation carries over $1 trillion in student loan debt. So they're very cause driven, they're very mission driven, but millennials are cash poor. So they're probably volunteering to get, um, of course they wanna be contributing and that's an important part of why they're volunteering, but they're also gonna respond well to a free pass, drinks, um, if you wanna do a volunteer mixer or an opportunity to bring everyone together to celebrate the time they've given. Um, millennials are gonna be the ones that really really enjoy that opportunity. So just a heads up. I don't think we have any Gen Zers in the room. Uh, this generation is so exciting to me. I know some Gen Zers and I think that they are incredible. They are just now entering the workforce. So these are like they're in their 20s, early 20s, early to mid 20s now. Um, and I think the most important thing to know about them is that they are truly huge. They're even bigger than the boomers. So they're far outnumbering the baby boomers. Um, they're the most culturally diverse generation, and in fact, they are the last generation where Caucasian is the majority um, of the group. So before 2006, the most common American surname was Smith, but it's now Rodriguez. So 49% of those born in 2006 identify as non-white. And they're digital natives. So this is, I think, equal parts a little scary, but also very exciting. 61% of children between the ages of eight and 17 have televisions in their bedrooms. 35% have video games, 14% have a DVD player, which is actually kind of funny and already like a little outdated because who plays DVDs? Um, but 4 million have their own cell phones. So I just think that this is incredible. Um, but it's also got this dark side where um, there's this new acronym called KGOY kids growing older, younger. There's a lot of data behind this, but one of the most interesting data points was um, something that Mattel shared, and they're a toy company. In the 90s, the average age of their target market was 10. In 2000, it became three years old. And that's because um, children are dropping toys in favor of digital things a lot sooner. You know, they like things that are bright, that glow, buttons they can push and touch. It makes total sense to me. I've got a niece who's um, two years old and I just see her immediately gravitating to the cell phone. She knows what they are and she loves to play with them. So it's, um, I think it's an interesting thing where they truly are growing older, but they're so, they're so young. So Gen Z as volunteers. So they're currently between four and 24. Uh, you're going to want to definitely consider minor waivers whenever they're volunteering for you. They're very inundated with brands on social media. So those of them that do have phones or access to a social media account, um, you know, they respond to brands. They're kind of conditioned. And so refreshing your logo, your design, um, it's not a bad idea to do that every now and then, especially if you've got an annual gala or some type of event that you're really trying to get them to volunteer at. Um, having a new look every year will be important. They are digital natives, so they're connected 10 plus hours per day. So whenever you can, try to leverage social media for your cause. Create a hashtag. Um, use a Snapchat filter for your big events. Um, you know, any, anytime you can have like a share on Facebook or share on Instagram, um, they're probably gonna respond to that and actually use it. Um, I thought this was interesting. 75% of teens want to convert their hobbies into full-time jobs. And so, especially for those that are um, like 18 and up, you can really frame the volunteer opportunities as a chance to polish a professional skill set that will help them down the road. So whatever interest they may have, you can probably find a way to apply it to um, some job development and job training. And I, I did promise you we would talk about texting. This blew my mind. Um, Gen Z teens receive over 3,000 text messages each month. So of course we're talking in averages, but that is, and I, it is just crazy to me. I'm a coach for girls on the run and I see them texting on their phones. I just, it is just crazy to me, but texting is becoming the, the dominant form of communication. So when in doubt, if you, you know, want to send that reminder email and you're looking at a Gen Z volunteer, go ahead and text them. It's not going to be too much. I don't think they're going to feel violated by having gotten a text from you to their personal cell phones. So go for it. Fire away. Text them all day long. 
So um, one thing that we know is that a multi-generational volunteer base is truly a competitive advantage. And I'm sure that everyone in the room would agree with this. The more diversity and inclusivity you can have in your volunteer program, the better off your nonprofit will be and the more effective and productive your volunteer force will be for you. But we also know that this doesn't happen accidentally. You know, a savvy coordinator, um, you have to be intentional and leverage the generational differences in how you communicate with your volunteers, how you incentivize them, how you thank them for the time that they've given. So I wanna be sure, as Tim mentioned before, to give you some tools to actually apply all this knowledge and all these, you know, for lack of a better word, kind of generalizations into real, you know, brass tacks, like how do we actually impact our volunteer program? So here's what we came up with. First, you wanna paint the picture. Um, even I forgot to do the poll in the room to find out, you know, how do you all identify? What is your generation? So um, don't make my mistake, ask your volunteers. Figure out how many of them are millennials, how many of them are boomers, how many of them happen to be a part of the silent generation or Gen Zers so that you can at least start with a picture and know who you're working with. Um, and this could be as simple as just having a birth date field on the volunteer application. So it doesn't need to be anything fancy. It's just a data point that you're collecting like all your other data points. Um, a common mistake that we see a lot of uh, employers and volunteer coordinators make is this assumption that you have to go all in on millennials. And, and the reason that this is a mistake is that Consequently, um, you'll ignore the other generations that are working for you. So don't feel like you have to go all in on millennials. Um, you know, you can divide your initiatives across all generations to make sure that you're catering to them. We know that successful volunteer programs enable everyone to demonstrate some leadership. Um, fun fact, 80% of millennials identify as leaders. That's so funny to me, like we can't all be leaders. Um, but, you know, it's very true when I talk to my friends, like we all identify as leaders. So if you can find ways to create leadership opportunities or things that feel like leadership opportunities, um, I think that uh, all generations are going to respond really well to that. Everybody wants to feel like they're contributing positively in a leadership way. And then um, there's sort of this thing called reverse mentoring, which is an opportunity for people of different generations to learn from each other and to, to actually work together and grow together. And so um, cultivating this idea of learning as a part, ongoing learning as a part of the volunteer culture is an important part of you know, having that reverse mentoring actually happen. So pair your, to it, the extent that you can, when you're able to pair your volunteers from different generations together, you know, force them to like mingle a little bit and I think you'll be pleased to find that, um, you know, there's a lot of great ideas from people of all ages and all backgrounds that will come together and, and improve your volunteer program overall. Once volunteers have given their time, there's a lot of ways to say thank you. Um, we know and the data shows us that um, just a thank you email is very effective. You know, don't feel like you have to go huge and get everyone tickets to a baseball game to thank them for their time at the end of the year. Um, you know, those things are always really nice, but they're not necessary um, to improving your retention rate. But since we're talking about generations, we also know that people respond to different mediums. So I think the first point that I wanted to make here, you have their attention. Um, the human attention span is now eight seconds. And you're, you're capturing these individuals and they're volunteering for you often for hours in a day. And when you add that up over a month, over a year, they've given you, um, you know, 10 to 100 hours of their time, which is so, it's such a cool thing in this, in this day and age to give that much of time and attention to a cause. So um, just, you know, remembering that this is a really novel thing that they're doing and then choosing the medium. So we all know it's important to say thank you, but how we think our volunteers um, is an important consideration to make. So we talked earlier about, um, you know, the silent generation really would prefer a handwritten note. Boomers would love a free beer, an opportunity to, um, you know, understand the impact that they made, but then get together and have a good time. And I think um, millennials really like to get together with each other. So having some kind of gathering for your volunteer groups is a way to say thank you. Um, will be received well by them for a Gen Z or you can just text them, you know, text them a funny meme. Thanks for your time. 
Um, that might be a little bit too much pandering, but it, you know, it could be effective. It's good to try different things. And then of course, cater the content. So I'm a millennial. What do I want to know about the time that I gave to you? I want to know collectively the impact. Um, I'd probably want to know if I volunteered as a part of my employer or part of a corporate group. I'd want to know how much time did we all spend giving for you? So how many hours did my group accumulate? Um, you know, you'll find that people respond to different things. So did everyone have a great time? What was the impact of the event itself or the nonprofit? You're saying thank you to a Gen Xer. You might want to consider sharing with them some statistics about the uh, socioeconomic impact of your nonprofit overall on the community. Remember for Gen Xers, it's about us, not me. So, you know, the, the actual content of that thank you could include different metrics to help drive the point home for the recipient that they actually made a difference. And then finally, staying top of mind. Um, we all know t-shirts are a great way to promote our nonprofit outside of you know, the volunteer experience, but volunteers are only gonna wear them if, they're, um, if the shirts are cool you know, and they reflect kind of what they value. And so you might wanna consider having different versions of your volunteer shirts and allowing your volunteers to pick the ones that they want. Um, you may find that boomers and Gen Xers just want a shirt that says, here's the event and I was a volunteer, whereas millennials and Gen Zers might pick the shirt with a funny thing on it or something quippy that um, will make other people laugh. So t-shirts are still a great thing to do. You definitely want to have t-shirts for your volunteers, but consider um, different options for people based on what will resonate with them. So multi-generational volunteer programs can be your secret sauce. We can leverage the unique strengths of each generation and enable them to learn from one another to create a collaborative, engaged environment. That's that ongoing learning that we talked about before. So um, I think we're good on time. I'm going to open it up now for questions, if that sounds good, Tim, and then we can dive in on the integration. Yeah. All right. So any questions relating to the, the content itself or, or comments? Um, happily will answer those. I mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll pitch you a question, uh, Kaylee, in terms of something that I was thinking about when, when listening to your content, which relates to, uh, you know, do you see any data in terms of how, cause we're hearing about overall, like engagement and volunteerism overall going down across the board, if I'm remembering correctly, is there, do we see any generational differences in that type of thing? Like, are, is that maybe like, because people are retiring out who've been volunteering for a long time and then millennials and Gen Z people are not replacing those folks as much? Like, wh where is that breakdown? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that doing this research is in response to the trend of volunteerism going down. Um, you know, as we learn um, these sort of these data trends, it's high level, like people are volunteering less. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to dig deeper and to think creatively, you know, how can we cater to these different groups in different ways, in unique ways to try to increase that retention and that engagement. So this is just one response. There are a lot of ways to get creative when you're doing outreach to your volunteers. Um, this is just one way to, to break them up, which is by generations, yep. you know, and, and trying to think how, okay, how can we creatively really focus on Gen Z? Let's try to get the new people in and excited about volunteering. So you can break them down any way that you'd like by region, geographically, um, by their background, you know, where they went to school, what their interests are, whatever it may be. Um, I think that this is just one response to that, but bigger picture, it's important to be creative and to keep trying new things to get people engaged and excited. Well, and the big thing that we're seeing is the fact that people want personalized communication mm -hmm. re regardless, right? Like, like, let's think about what's coming up on December 3rd, Giving Tuesday. And if, and, and so I even did a presentation earlier today based off of one of our other partner webinars that we did a few weeks ago on Giving Tuesday. And what we found is that Giving Tuesday themselves outright says it's Giving Tuesday, not Fundraising Tuesday. And so we're seeing a lot of people who are trying to personalize their engagement to either thank their donors or to encourage volunteering as opposed to giving money. Get involved with the organization. Even, even myself, 
who I consider myself a savvy person that understands these types of things. I was sitting in a recent volunteer meeting and it wasn't until I was given the opportunity to actually go into the local boys and girls club and like connect with the kids that, that yes, I'm on the committee, but it wasn't until that moment where I could visualize me actually helping someone in person that I got like actually excited about being on the committee itself. So we got some other questions. Um, coming in okay so first emily our our uh, our millennial avatar for today asks i've read a variety of figures out there is there a standard for attaching value to your volunteer by hour Ooh, that's a good one in terms of to wait uh, a way to show their full value when budgeting which i i i believe there is like a standard but but what's the what's the expert's opinion kaylee when it comes to this oh gosh i mean i don't know if i'm an expert but i will tell you what we see most often is yeah. minimum wage you can take their time and you can multiply it by minimum wage and you can say, you know, this, you can add up that dollar, you can come up with that dollar value and you can say, you know, you represented the equivalent of this monetary donation in time mm. to our nonprofit organization. Or, you know, you can translate it into savings. You helped us to more efficiently save or, you know, increase our operations by volunteering your time. So you can equate it to money. You can also equate it to impact. Um, and that can be what it can be unique to your nonprofit. However, you measure the impact of the work you do in your community, you can find a way to tie that back to the hours um, and get creative here because there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, for example, if I volunteered 10 hours, let's do, let's just do Girls on the Run because I um, I've been a coach with them. Great organization. Oh, and awesome. my wife is thinking about doing that with our local group. So uh, that's yeah. that's great. Okay. Glad to hear it, Tim. It's a wonderful nonprofit. That's great um, nonprofit. And, yeah, for those of you who don't know, it's an after-school program for girls who are in elementary school and middle school now uh, to go and, and they run. We all run together and you have a coach and then we talk about time management and leadership and we talk about trust and building relationships and it's, it's a great curriculum. Um, but as a coach, let's say I got an email from Girls on the Run and it said, Kaylee, you know, you volunteered this month, you volunteered 20 hours to Girls on the Run. There's so many ways that we can translate that into impact. We could do it by the miles the girls have run. We can do it by the number of girls that were impacted. We can do it by, um, gosh, I'm trying to think, you know, the even testimonials. So what the girls say, you know, they're, they're constantly tracking and, and writing down what the girls say about the program. So there's a lot of ways um, to tie that number of hours back to value, even if those two numbers don't necessarily equate monetarily. So don't be afraid to get creative. You know, people want to believe that they're having an impact. So put together the numbers and throw it out there and let them know how, how their impact was received. Awesome. All right. We got some great other questions coming in. So we're going to start with Marsha while I, I digest Karen's question. Um, want to make sure we also have a quick bit of time to showcase the, the walkthrough, but we're really healthy on time. So we can yeah. definitely keep doing questions. Okay. Would love your comments on generations and team leaders. I love this question, by the way. We have 50 for 1,600 slots, 1,000 volunteers. We're actively seeking young leaders, but are definitely boomer heavy in terms of their leadership. So what would, what would you say to approach that, Kaylee? First of all, Marsha, my goodness, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> You wow. are a busy lady. Um, that's a lot of volunteers to be managing. And good on you for recruiting leaders. Um, it can be hard to sort of let go of, of different parts of your volunteer program, but elevating people into positions of leadership allows you to distribute some of the work and responsibility, and it empowers those individuals to have more ownership in the volunteer program overall. So good for you, Marsha. So if I'm understanding correctly, I think the question is, you know, how do we get younger people interested in these volunteer leader positions? Did I get mm -hmm. that right? It's, I think that's a good, a good gist of it. And it does relate to Karen's question too, that we'll get into, but I want to focus on Marsh's specific elements of leadership right now. Okay. Okay. I think, um, and this is going to be a very Kaylee answer. So I, you know, I don't have a lot of data behind this, but this has just been my experience. I believe very strongly that words matter. And we know that millennials, especially identify as leaders. So when you're, when you're positioning these group leader opportunities, think about, and maybe even just go to thesaurus.com and type in the word leadership and find all the words that would not necessarily be buzzwords, but would resonate with a millennial to help them understand this is an opportunity to show and demonstrate leadership or to develop your leadership skills. 
And because we know millennials really like the, you know, the breakdown of this is what the role entails, spend some time, do some bullet points, identify what the responsibilities really are of the leaders, and then maybe get creative. So if group leaders can recruit their own members, maybe it's an opportunity because we know millennials love to work in groups. Perhaps this is a chance for a millennial to step up, go out there, find a bunch of their friends and create a group of their own. So we're, we're kind of appealing to their, their desire to be leaders. We're appealing to their desire to have things very clear and concise in terms of when they're gonna be working and what they'll be doing. And we're appealing to their um, tendency to work together in groups with their friends. Millennials are very experiential. We know that Gen Zers are looking for any opportunity that can turn into, um, like they want their hobbies to become their jobs. So if a Gen Z is interested in volunteering with you, it's because they have passion for this, they care about it, and you might be able to position it to Gen Zers as this is, a, this is an opportunity for you to develop some professional skills that can serve you down the road in future employment. Awesome. And actually, I think that does help a little bit with Karen's question, but I want to state it because it's a really good one outright is as a not-for-profit cancer care organization, Gen Z would be a tough sell as they seem to be motivated to volunteer for personal gain or experience the further their career as opposed to support mm -hmm. a cause that they can, quote, save the world or support sure. their neighborhood. And I've experienced this. For me, this is a challenging generation and not my mm -hmm. best volunteers, a tough group to draw in suggestions. And, and let's cycle in to the, to, the, to the healthcare side, the cancer care side too, because um, I think that's important. I, I, I'm actually reading an, a, a, an amazing book, uh, Philanthropy in America by Oliver Zunz. And even the, the connection to our idea of mass philanthropy, like donating as an individual a few dollars, can be traced back to healthcare, actually tuberculosis. And so, uh, so really, really interesting in terms of like our, our idea of philanthropy and generosity in America has cultural basis in healthcare, but if we're starting to struggle with that from a generational standpoint, how do we adapt that? So, so again, my nerdy random history tidbit aside, Kaylee, because I'm obsessed with that book recently, <laughs> everybody should check it out. What do you think in terms of Gen Z and, and, and this situation that Karen's engaging? I would like to answer this question with a story. So um, I live in Iowa. Our company is headquartered in Des Moines, which is the capital city of Iowa. And I went to college at the University of Iowa in Iowa City, which is not too far from here. Mm -hmm. um, the, of course, the Children's Hospital um, is at, located at the University of Iowa is a world-renowned hospital for children. And um, it's right next to Kinnick Stadium. And there's big windows in the children's ward so they can look out and see, you know, 30 to 50,000 people every Saturday watching and tailgating for the football team to play at Kinnick Stadium. And some of you may already know the story, but um, someone had the idea that it would be really fun at halftime to turn around and wave to the kids. And it sparked a movement. And it's unreal. I mean, I was in tears when I first experienced it. The entire stadium turns around and waves to the kids now at halftime. Um, and it's just, it's just incredible. It's an incredible thing. It's an incredible movement. It has a hashtag, a t-shirt, a logo. People talk about it. It's called The Wave, and it's really cool to be a part of it when you go to an Iowa football game. It's just a part of the, what they do now, and the kids love it. And one outcome of this was suddenly Gen Z people were really excited about volunteering and even donating to the hospital. Hmm. So it had this incredible, you know, a lot of effects that came out of it. And I, I tell the story because I think the takeaway here is that Gen Z, they're similar to millennials in that they're experiential. You know, they wanna have an experience associated with your organization. But you also, and I, this is a tall order, but you gotta make it cool. You gotta make it something that's memorable. You have to make it something that, is um, for lack of a better word, viral. You know, this, this wave is truly a hashtag. If you go and you just look up the wave, you're gonna see picture after picture and video after video of people tailgating or at the football game and they're waving to kids and the kids are waving back and it's amazing. Hmm. Um, and so I, I think that that really resonated with Gen Z and we can learn from that, that it, to get in front of Gen Z and to really inspire them, you have to make this something that they want to be a part of. You almost have to appeal to their FOMO, their fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and I think that also syncs up with ensuring that you can personalize things. People like personalization, I think, no matter what generation. Um, but, but if you don't have good data, we're going to transition. If you don't have good data on all those people, then that's going to be difficult. So, Kaylee, you have a fantastic volunteer program <laughs> that, that does all these different types of things. I'm interested in terms of showcasing to the crowd the types of stuff that you can get pulled into a CRM, in this case, neon CRM, I'd love to, to have us go over that piece because that is important. We want to take the practical lessons of what we learned today and shift that into how you can manage this. Now, if you're on the call and you're actually not a volunteer local uh, user yet, but you have volunteer needs, definitely reach out to Kaylee. She can help you out. In turn, if you're not a neon CRM user, then one of the cool things that actually Volunteer Local has opted into is that if you do sign with me on CRM, they, because of Volunteer Local, they're going to help uh, get a donation made to your organization. So they opted into our donation program, which I'm really excited about. So, so this is something that we, we are kind of debuting today in, our, in terms of our partnership that because of Volunteer Local, new Neon CRM users can actually get some, some uh, reimbursement back to their organization because of working together with Volunteer Local. But how does it actually work together? Kaylee, what did you folks program? All right, well, let's dig in. This is, uh, this is where the, like, the real nerd is gonna come out. This is my bread and butter. Um, this is Volunteer Local. So I recognize a lot of the names in the room today. I know a lot of you already use Volunteer Local. What I wanna show you today is really specific to the NEON integration. And Tim mentioned, um, you know, we'll help contribute monetarily to your nonprofit organization as a part of this partnership. We are really proud to be aligned with NEON um, in that regard and grateful to you, Tim, for the opportunity to funnel some of those donations back to our customers. Yeah. So let's talk about how this works. Um, in your Volunteer Local account, this should look very familiar to those of you who use Volunteer Local. What you want to do is pop on over to your settings page. This is where the NEON integration lives and it's under the integration section. We've got Donor Perfect in here, we've got NEON, which is our new one. We're gonna have more coming out in 2020, which we're very excited about. And um, the way that it works, you wanna put in your API key and your organization ID. Now, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but these are both uh, available inside the NEON account, right? They're accessible to the customers? Absolutely, and the fact that you have the guide built right into this interface will show people exactly where to find that because part of our certification program is ensuring that documentation makes this easy to actually look up and understand how it works. So absolutely, so yeah. The yes. documentation's accessible here. Actually, you can get to the documentation within Neon Serum itself under our certified integrations okay. area too. So, um, so yeah, this is easy, easy to connect. Doesn't take that long. I actually, I popped this in last night. Kaylee got me this for today's presentation and it took me like literally a minute tops to get this connected. <laughs> Awesome. And thank you for pointing that out too about the documentation. Um, <clears throat> this can be something that we send to everyone as well. Um, in addition to the recording, we can include the documentation so that you have it easily in front of you. Yep. Um, and then what you'll do is, um, this is a, a test account, so we don't actually have any live data points here to match to. But what you'll do using these drop downs is you'll assign the data and volunteer local to the corresponding column um, on the table in NEON. So this integration allows you to take all your volunteer data from Volunteer Local and push it into NEON CRM. It's not a two-way street. We are a feeder into NEON. So your volunteer data is gonna stay pristine and only volunteers in Volunteer Local, but then we're gonna push everything out to NEON um, so that NEON becomes the place where you're tracking not only the monetary donations that your advocates are making for your nonprofit, but the time donations that they're giving to you by volunteering throughout the year. Yep. So this is a, a little bit more of a holistic approach to tracking the volunteer impact, the advocacy impact. So inside a report, once we've got the integration set up, anytime you go to a report, you'll have this button to sync hours with Neon CRM. When you click this button, it'll just go line by line. It'll sync each volunteer in. The good news is that you could click this button nine times a day, all day long, and it will not create duplicates. Yes, so if, that's another key thing about our, <laughs> our certification program. It doesn't create duplicate records, yeah. but if there's new volunteer data, it's gonna add that to the system uh, in a special area just for volunteer local data that you can even name yourself. We do prompt you to name it, 
volunteer local, you know, hours yeah. track, <laughs> uh, which is, which is pretty key. Absolutely. So we can do it, you know, for the entire report in one click, um, but you can also do it by individual. So I can expand a shift here, click on any volunteer's name to open up their profile, and then I can sync just this volunteer's data into Neon CRM using the button here. So we give you the tools to do it by individual or event-wide, um, and then you can, you can sync as often as you'd like, or you could wait till the end of the year and just click that button one time, and we'll push all their data over into Neon, including the jobs they worked, the events they worked for, and the hours they gave. What's, what, and what I love about this is because of how we've designed everything is that this data can be flowing in and you know that these are new volunteers, but then using other integrations, you'd be able to either get updated address information on them, you know, with, with NCOA updates that can happen nightly. You could do wealth screening on these people. You can actually help encourage them to sign up for for peer-to-peer -peer campaigns through through our rally-bound peer-to-peer. And, and, and you can push them to your, your constant contact, your MailChimp list if you want to communicate with all of them. And all of this is going to be able to be seen right in Neon CRM. Um, but, but the thing that, that I've been wanting for years is shift management. And that's why, like, Volunteer Local is, is the premier partner when it comes to our volunteer management for any of this type of stuff. This is it. This is who we're working with. <laughs> and so, uh, so it's really, really exciting to be able to have all of this available for, for, you know, the thousands of neon CRM users right now. Well, thank you so much for your kind words, Tim. We're, we're really proud to be aligned with you. And I'm so grateful to all of you today for being on the webinar. Yeah. We will get you the recording after this is done. And if you do have any questions for me, um, please do contact me directly. Uh, my email is just Kaylee at volunteerlocal.com. And uh, my phone number, we'll include actually all that probably in the follow-up email, right? So yeah, we'll, we'll be following up. And there was also a request for those slides. I, I asked you for, okay. for uh, access to the deck. Um, it's just no goofy neon, neon email stuff. So uh, we'll, we'll get that deck over to people who want it. Otherwise, uh, really want to thank everyone for today attending today's special Halloween theme presentation. This is the extent of the Halloween element. But, uh, uh, you know, definitely uh, follow us for updates uh, at Neon CRM on Twitter, um, uh, at Volunteer Local uh, as well. And I uh, want to thank everybody for, for attending today. And have a happy Halloween, everyone. I hope that uh, you got a lot of fun stuff planned with your family. Kaylee, any final words for, for folks today? No, just thank you so much for, for being on the call and uh, happy Halloween. Awesome. This was such a great presentation. Thanks, everyone. We'll try to get this recording up later today. Bye, everyone.